I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. More than 24 hours after Election Day, we still have no clear winner in this presidential race, but Joe Biden is ahead in electoral votes, leading President Trump 253 to 213. We are paying special attention today to Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia. If he wins any two of those, he will get to 270. That's the numbers you know required for victory. Biden is also way ahead in the popular vote with more than, listen to this number, 71 million people. That's the most of any presidential candidate in history. We are also tracking different reactions from the candidates. President Trump is suggesting there has been fraud without any evidence, and he's also making legal challenges. By contrast, former Vice President Joe Biden is calling for patience. Election protests intensifying as thousands take to the streets, demanding that every vote be counted. Ainsley. Ashley Strohmeyer is live with the chaos erupting in cities across our country. Hey, Ashley. Hey, Ainsley. Police clashed with a mob of protesters in various cities across the country last night. Now, it was peaceful at first. They raised Biden campaign signs and then chanted, count the vote, but then it got completely out of control. 60 people ended up being arrested in New York City for setting fires, spitting in officers' faces, and even punching an NYPD chief in the face. Police also found weapons and loaded magazines during an arrest. Now, in Detroit, protesters were furious over the lack of access to the ballot counting process. Officials ended up padlocking those doors so they couldn't get in. Those protesters were chanting, stop the vote, following news of the president filing that lawsuit in Michigan. And a riot was declared in Portland because of widespread violence. And then in Philly, the protests were twofold. They were calling for racial and political justice. That follows the release of body camera footage in the police shooting of Walter Wallace Jr. Listen. Down. Get him. Put the knife down. Shoot him. Move, move, move. Put the knife down. And following that release, thousands are demanding those officers involved be arrested. There were also protests in Maricopa County, Arizona. That's where the protesters were also demanding to get inside to watch those ballots be counted. In Arizona overnight, hundreds of Trump supporters, some armed, gathered outside a Phoenix election center, saying the election was being stolen from the president. Inside, nearly 400,000 mail-in and in-person ballots were being counted. Protesters there looking to keep the count going as the race tightens. While in Michigan, a different chant. After the president filed a lawsuit over increased access to ballots, it comes as protests broke out across the country overnight, including New York City, Chicago, Minneapolis, and Los Angeles, where frustrated Trump and Biden supporters took to the streets after the president falsely claimed victory despite ballots still being counted in several states, tempers flaring from coast to coast. Joe Biden! Joe Biden's covering up this election! He's stealing it! For many Americans, the uncertain outcome of the presidential election is adding to the anxiety of an already stressful year. According to a survey by the Associated Press, about six in ten of the nation's voters feel this country is on the wrong track. Our lead national correspondent, that's David Begno, spoke with Americans who are on edge as this process plays out. David, good morning to you. A lot of people are relating to this. Good morning, my friend. Here we are in Times Square live this morning, and I'm thinking back to yesterday when we listened. A lot, did a lot of listening to about a dozen people, Gail. When you talk to the Biden supporters, 
They're nervous, stomach in knots, on eggshells, checking their phone, watching the television. But when you speak to the Trump supporters, it is clear. They knew exactly what they were voting for. They believe he's going to win, and they specifically voted because they wanted four more years of Trump. The anxiety in America right now is spilling out into the streets. Watch. From New York to Chicago to Las Vegas, protesters on both sides of the political divide took to the streets Wednesday. Some people are angered by President Trump's declaration that he already had the votes to win before all the votes had even been counted. The concern is that uh, Donald Trump may seek to interfere in the vote count. Meanwhile, in Detroit, dozens of Trump supporters protested outside of a vote counting center shortly before Michigan was declared a win for Joe Biden. Every voice counts. And in the battleground state of Pennsylvania, which is also still counting mail-in and provisional ballots, voters say the tension there is intense. I am absolutely in a state of high anxiety. I've never seen a president act this way. 21-year-old Zion Moronga is from Pennsylvania. I met him at the Sussex sit-in and chat diner in nearby New Jersey. And what's your anxiety level? Yeah, I'm definitely a bit anxious just because in past elections it hasn't taken this long and hasn't been like all this like suspense. So that's a bit like jarring, I guess. Not everyone I met was as concerned like 80-year-old Trump supporter Lewis Post. How anxious are you feeling right now about the results? I feel good. I feel good. I think he's going to get in. But Lewis's wife, Carol, was worried about claims of widespread voter fraud. The ballots have been thrown away. They've been, you know, they've been thrown away. They found ballots all over the place. But that's not true. There has not been no widespread ballot throwing no, away. That's what I heard. That's what you heard? Right. And where, where are you hearing that and from? And I heard that from the president. You heard it from the president? Right. <laughs> yeah. And you believe what he says? Uh, I'd like to believe what he says. He's our president. Do you always believe what he says? I'd rather not say. So you believe the president when he says that mail-in ballots have been thrown away, but you chose to vote mail-in ballot? Yeah, because, uh, because of the virus. Miss Post said, listen, she believes the virus is real. That's why she wears a mask. She did not want to tell us who she voted for. She says there's a big divide in her family and she didn't want to get herself in any trouble. The United States is divided on just about every issue. Race, gay marriage, transgenderism, abortion, and the list goes on. Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation as we read in Matthew 12, 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. My question is this, with everything that is happening in the U.S. right now, are we witnessing the desolation of America? Days after the re-election of President Alassane Ouattara, his supporters take to the streets with a victory dance. But the mood isn't the same among the opposition. Many oppose Ouattara continuing in power, saying his bid for a third term was unconstitutional. While Ivory Coast has a limit of two presidential terms, Ouattara has insisted a new constitution in 2016 allowed him to run again. The homes of key opposition figures have been surrounded by police after some announced a transitional council saying they would prepare for a new election. The government called that an affront to constituted authority. The government said it deployed at least 35,000 security personnel across the country for the vote. At least nine people were killed in fighting between political supporters and security forces on election day, according to local authorities. Dozens were also reported killed in pre-election violence. That's on Tuesday day. night, the convoys of two cabinet ministers were attacked and some people reportedly killed, raising fears of more violence. More than 3,000 people have crossed into neighboring countries, fearing the outbreak of post-election violence similar to that seen in 2010 and 2011. The United Nations Office of the Coordinator for Humanitarian Affairs says at least 2,600 people are now in Liberia and it expects more to follow in the coming days. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, 
pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Cancel culture, more violence across America, freedom of speech and religion, all at risk. Concerns growing in America that we may be headed towards totalitarianism. Gary Lane gives us a closer look at an ominous warning, especially for Christians. When many of us think about totalitarianism, George Orwell's 1984 or the former Soviet Union often come to mind. Government inflicts terror and suffering on its people to force them to conform. The senior editor of the American Conservative contends America is fast becoming what he calls a soft totalitarian state. Rod Dreher's premise is featured in the new book, Live Not By Lies, a manual for a Christian dissidents. Ours is going to be a more soft version where they use the infliction of economic pain and marginalization and shaming to force Christians out of the public square and to compel us to conform with left-wing ideology. Uh, and the fact that it's soft does not mean it is any less totalitarian. Just after World War II, German-born philosopher Hannah Arendt wrote that loneliness and social alienation had been the major precursors to the rise of totalitarianism, both in Nazi Germany and in Bolshevik Russia. Dreyer says today social media is a major driver behind isolation and unease, especially among young people. It has made them desperate for something to to solve their problem of alienation and their anxiety. I think that this is opening them up to the acceptance of a false idol that will be totalitarian, that will tell them, we can take care of all your problems, we can fix it if you will only say yes to us. That's what happened in Russia, and that's what happened in Germany, and that's what's coming here. And those who advocate Judeo-Christian values and reject the lies of the new American leftist state will be marginalized and singled out for persecution. Conservative Christians and their churches and institutions are seen as an obstacle to progress. If you stand against uh, LGBT rights, for example, if you stand against abortion rights, if you stand against critical race theory, you are a problem. Alienated and stressed over COVID-19 restrictions, American youth are readily taking to the streets to demand social change. A radical doctrine called critical race theory is inflaming their frustrations. Anne Hendershot is director of the Veritas Center for Ethics and Public Life at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. She is author of the new book, The Politics of Envy. Professor Hendershot feels critical race theory divides Americans by promoting envy. I see a, a huge increase in rhetoric surrounding envy, encouraging envy. And I think it's pretty evil. I mean, I think your listeners, Christians, know that it's a serious sin, that envy is one of the, the seven deadly sins. Hendershot says politicians foment hatred and resentment by publicly promoting the divisive race doctrine. When you hear a politician like Mayor de Blasio in New York City say there's plenty of money in New York City, it's just in the wrong hands. He's implying that that's your money that they have, and we need to take it back. All Christians ought to be against racism. We are. But critical race theory is something very different. It draws a line uh, between good and evil between the races and alienates the races and turns us against each other when we ought to be standing together. And instead of resorting to harsh tactics to control people, Dreyer sees the future U.S. government taking a softer, less violent approach. We are going to see something develop in this country like the Chinese have today, the social credit system, where they monitor everything Chinese citizens do. They get all the data from their computers, from the Internet and so forth, and they assign them a rating. The, the more socially positive you are from a communist point of view, the higher your rating, the more your privileges. Attending church would lower your social credit score. And a lower rating means fewer privileges like sending your child to college. Dreyer feels it doesn't matter who is elected president because neither Biden nor Trump will be able to reverse the course. He says we're living through the birth pangs of a cultural revolution.
This sort of thing is marching through all the institutions. It's marching through churches. It's marching through universities, seminaries, corporations. And we Christians have got to be prepared for it. By building networks among churches to endure persecution. Hope for the best, but we also have to remember ours is a religion of martyrdom. Those who, who suffered and even died for the faith, they received a crown of glory. That may well be our calling, and we need to accept it as believers. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Psalm 107, 33 and 34. He turns rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. In Indonesia's southernmost province, farmers are struggling through a water crisis. The peak of the dry season was supposed to end in August, but months later, little has changed. Because of this long dry season, we are all experiencing crop failure. Dried out from the inside, none of these crops can be eaten or sold. The farmers say they've also been struggling financially because of COVID-19 measures, which saw their local markets restrict hours or close altogether. Because of COVID-19, it is more difficult. Our income is almost nothing. It's difficult to buy food. She says they haven't received any assistance from the government. Indonesia's National Disaster Agency issued a warning this month for extreme weather caused by the La Nina weather phenomenon, including lower rainfall than normal for some provinces. For this community, it means walking three kilometres to access clean water. This school was shut for months, not only due to the pandemic, but because its taps had run dry. During the pandemic, children needed to continuously wash their hands. But because we have no water, we were forced to shut the school. It has finally reopened, but there's still no water. As some cities endure drought, others, including the capital, are preparing for the peak of the monsoon season. And experts say local authorities need to start preparing now. Regular cleanups are underway to stop rubbish from clogging waterways. It will happen simultaneously. La Nina will reach its peak and the rainy season will also peak. So we're warning all sides to get ready. Some areas have already experienced flooding and as the weather worsens, the government has expressed concerns about possible infection clusters at emergency shelters for people who've been displaced. For Indonesia, the transition in seasons and the extreme weather that comes with it just adds to the troubles of a country already struggling with the impact of the pandemic. Authorities in Nicaragua are scrambling to evacuate thousands of people caught in the path of Hurricane Ada. With winds of 240 kilometers per hour, the powerful Category 4 hurricane hammered the Nicaraguan coast for hours as it slowly inched toward landfall. We are taking our things out, looking for a safer place to take shelter because of fear. To protect ourselves above all, we're looking for a safer place to weather the hurricane. The National Hurricane Center has called Ada an extremely dangerous storm. In the community of Bilwi in northeast Nicaragua, many families were moved to higher ground over concerns of potentially life-threatening storm surge and deadly winds. We had to come to this place because we're not safe in our houses, because we live near the beach, so we had to come here to take refuge, the whole family. Ada is the 12th hurricane of the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season. It's also the most powerful storm to hit this region in years.
Environmental experts say there's a direct link between climate change and the intensity of hurricanes, making it increasingly difficult for people to prepare effectively for stronger storms. Though Ada will weaken quickly as it tracks inland, the slow-moving storm is expected to dump heavy rains over Nicaragua and Honduras for several more days, raising the potential for deadly floods and mudslides across a wide portion of Central America. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. In a living room in Armenia, these people are anxious. We're not identifying the parents, just in case it leads to their son being mistreated. He's a prisoner of war held by Azerbaijan's military. His mother and father had no idea he'd even gone to the front lines. Now they're waiting and hoping, trying to keep their spirits up. I have no information on how he is, where he is, what condition he's in. When we call, the answer is the same. It is the same from the Human Rights Defenders and Red Cross. They tell us everything will be fine. It will be good. I have no idea what's going to happen. It's no wonder they are worried. Three weeks ago, Azerbaijani social media platforms shared video of two Armenians being captured in Nagorno-Karabakh. More footage shows what looks like the same two men, bound and draped in Armenian and Nagorno-Karabakh flags. Then they're shot dead. Azerbaijan's government says the video is fake. But Armenia is accused of carrying out possible war crimes too. On October the 28th, 21 people were reported killed in a rocket attack on the Azerbaijani town of Bada, the biggest civilian loss of life in this war so far. Both Armenia and Azerbaijan are hitting civilian areas, and there's evidence they're using cluster bombs, banned by more than 100 countries, though not these two. The International Committee of the Red Cross says it's engaged in talks with both sides to remind them of their obligations under international humanitarian law and to allow access to prisoners of war. Much of the modern identities of Armenia and Azerbaijan rest on their animosity towards each other and their fight over Nagorno-Karabakh. Strong voices in each country argue that they are the historical victim and that they have the monopoly on truth. And this is a dangerous situation for human rights in this conflict. As the world continues to spin out of control, we can no longer afford to ignore the truth. Almighty God, the creator of heaven, earth, and all things is trying to get our attention. He is letting us know through powerful weather catastrophes and the events happening in the world around us that he is in control. 
and he is preparing to intervene in world affairs climaxing in the return of Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.